Lecture number six for chapter 22 on the respiratory system. We're going to talk about some respiratory volumes. So this is some respiratory volume terminology that you will probably encounter as you continue uh, in your health sciences education. So there are different respiratory lung volumes and then there also are capacities which are uh, measurements of combinations of lung volumes as we'll see uh, in a few moments. <clears throat> and these different measurements, these are things that actually can be measured with an instrument called a spirometer and uh, they can be used to assess how well a person is ventilating. You know, are their lungs working properly? Do they have lung obstructions? Do they have something that is restricting airflow in the uh, within the lungs. So these volumes are used and calculations are made to help uh, assess a person's respiratory health. Okay, so the first one is not too hard. Just kind of follow along with me here. Um, tidal volume. That is the volume of air that you inhale or exhale with a normal breath. So normal breathing under resting conditions. In both males and females, that's about 500 milliliters. So if you think about a two-liter bottle of Coca-Cola, uh, about one quarter of that is what you move in and out with each breath. All right, now think about your, take a normal inhale, and then inhale, after you do that, take an inhale in that is as deep as possible. Okay, that is your, the extra air that you took in after that normal inhalation is called your IRV or inspiratory reserve volume. That's how much extra air can you take in above a normal inhale or above an, a normal inspiration. That's about 3,100 milliliters in a male and about 1,900 in a, in a female. Okay, you also have an expiratory reserve volume, or ERV, and that's the volume of air that you can force out of your lungs after a normal exhale. So if you just do a normal tidal volume, inhale and exhale, and then blow out as much air as you can, that extra air that you blew out is called your ERV, or expiratory reserve volume, and that's about 1,200 milliliters in a male. Um, and 700 in your average female. Then your residual volume, you're always going to have some air remaining in your lungs that you can't blow out. If you blew all the air out of your lungs, your lungs would collapse. And so that is called your residual volume, or RV, and that is about 1,200 milliliters in an average adult male and about 1,100 in an average female. So you can see males versus females, this is another one of those gender differences where you've got uh, big differences in an average between an average male and female in terms of how much extra air you can take in and how much extra air you can actually blow out. And of course that goes back to, you know, the the men are all running on the plains chasing the wild game for dinner, so we have to have these extra respiratory increased respiratory volumes to help supply the oxygen gas to power those types of things and to help us get rid of our excess carbon dioxide that we're generating from from running quickly and throwing spears at our at dinner. Alright, then there are some capacities, respiratory capacities, that are also measured when assessing patients uh, who may have respiratory problems. And the first one is called your total lung capacity. Alright, so that is the total volume um, of all of the air inside your lungs, the maximum it could ever be. That's your total lung capacity. And so that is about 6,000 milliliters for males. That's about three two-liter bottles of Coke. That's kind of hard to imagine when you think about it. Uh, you think about how big a two-liter bottle of Coke is and you can get <laughs> three volumes worth of those uh, into, your, into your lungs. 4,200 milliliters in females. So total lung capacity includes all of those volumes we talked about before. Your tidal volume, because that's what you move in and out with each breath. Uh, the IRV, that's the extra air you can inhale. The ERV is the extra air you can exhale if you forcibly exhale. <clears throat> and then your RV, the residual volume, is air that you never 
uh, you can't force out without your lungs collapsing. So you put all those things together and that's called your total lung capacity. Now the vital capacity is the amount of air that uh, the maximum amount of air, vital refers to life, life capacity. What's the volume of air, the maximum amount that you can really move in and out of your lungs? If you were breathing with a maximum inhale followed by a maximum exhale, that's going to be your vital capacity. So that includes tidal volume, inspiratory reserve volume, and expiratory reserve volume. So the only thing it's leaving out is that residual volume. So if you look over here, we said that was 1,200 in males and 1,100 in females. That's the air that you don't ever get rid of. And so if you compare these two values, you're going to subtract 1,200 from 6,000 for males. You're going to subtract 1,100 from 4,200 for females. Here's more for, for males. <clears throat> Um, inspiratory capacity, that is the maximum amount of air that you can take in after a normal exhale. So if you just do a normal, not a maximum exhale, but a, a normal exhale, if you were breathing normally, that would be a tidal volume. And then you're going to add your inspiratory reserve volume, add those two things together, and that's called your inspiratory capacity. So that's going to be 3,600 in males, 2,400 in females. And if you go back over here and look at what we took a look at before, tidal volume, inspiratory reserve volume, 3,100 plus 500, that's 3,600 for males, 1,900 plus 500, that's 2,400 for females. Then finally, we have the FRC. Uh, that's called the functional residual capacity. And uh, that's the amount of air that's remaining in your lungs after a normal tidal volume uh, inhalation, exhalation. Okay, so normally you don't get down to that residual volume. Normally, the amount of air that's left in your lungs after an exhale is that residual volume that would never move out, plus the ERV, that expiratory reserve volume that you only get rid of if you forcibly exhale. So that's called your functional residual capacity. That's the volume of air you normally have left over in your lungs after a regular exhale. That's 2400 in milliliters in males and 1800 milliliters in females. Air volume in, within your lungs, air that's in there but it's never used for gas exchange. So think about you know you're always going to have air left over in your bronchial passages, your bronchioles, those alveolar ducts that aren't actually making it to the alveoli because you've got to be in there for any gas exchange to take place. That's the only place where you have a thin enough respiratory membrane to allow gas to exchange between the blood and the air. So uh, that air can also be referred to as dead space air. And there are conditions that increase dead space air. For example, if you have something like tuberculosis that winds up killing alveoli in the lungs, or um, many years of smoking can increase dead space in, in lungs for, sorry about that, go away, apple, <laughs> can increase dead space in the lungs as well. Um, because if you kill alveoli due to an infection or some sort of a disease state, long-term smoking, um, air that enters those spaces created from alveoli that have died becomes dead space where you're not actually having any gas exchange occurring with the blood. Okay, so this, uh, this picture here from your textbook is showing a patient who is hooked up to a spirometer. So it's basically a tube and you blow into it after taking the deepest inhales possible or just doing a normal breathe in, breathe out. You also forcibly exhale as much air as you can. And <clears throat> the volume of the air, those air changes, is measured by the spirometer and it can be graphed out. And um, you guys can take a look at this graph either here or on your textbook. You know, this is your tidal volume. This is the uh, a maximal inhale, this is a maximal exhale, and this is representing down here at the bottom of the graph the residual volume of air left over 
in your lungs. And then it's showing you the combinations of these things that come together for your inspiratory capacity and functional residual capacity and vital capacities and total lung capacity and so forth. So this information is useful to respiratory experts and people who treat respiratory conditions because changes in these volumes or deviations from normal can provide clues about what's going on uh, with a patient if they have some sort of respiratory disorder. A really powerful thing about spirometry is that it can distinguish between pulmonary diseases that are obstructive versus restrictive. So obstructive as the name, and the terminology can be kind of confusing at first, but obstructive means your air passages are obstructed for some reason. There's something that's blocking the airflow. Uh, now that could just be because you have uh, bronchoconstriction going on. So the walls of the bronchi have constricted or the bronchioles have constricted and um, due to something like asthma, for example. So if you think about it, if the walls of your bronchioles and bronchi are contracted, constricted, it's going to be more difficult for air to move in and out of the lungs. And some other things that can trigger that bronchitis, so if you have inflammation uh, and infection of the bronchi going on, emphysema, um, which is usually triggered by many years of smoking, can cause obstructive pulmonary disease. You can have um, uh, inflammation and congestion and so forth that's associated with uh, emphysema due to the damage to the respiratory passages in the alveoli that occur. Asthma, like we were just talking about, <clears throat> which is where your bronchial passages deliberately constrict um, in an inappropriate manner. Cystic fibrosis is a genetic-based disease that unfortunately some people have. And, and people who have cystic fibrosis, they produce a very thick, sticky mucus. And it builds up in their respiratory passages. And it's, it's not normal mucus that could be coughed out really easily to help you clear your lower respiratory tract. And cystic fibrosis, it tends to build up. And so that's going to be a type of obstructive pulmonary disease. It's blocking the airflow. <clears throat> so we're not going to go into uh, the details on how you, the types of measurements and so forth you take. There are articles on the internet that explain this in more detail, but um, one of the things you look for with obstructive pulmonary disease, if you think about it, it's not only the volumes and capacities, but also, you know, how fast can you exhale? Because if you have an obstructive pulmonary disease, you're not going to be able to blow the air out of your lungs as quickly as if you don't, because it's obstructed and it's blocked from flowing. Then you have restrictive disorders. This is where um, you start getting into these capacity measurements, because if you have a restrictive disorder, you have a reduction in a total lung, in total lung capacity for some reason. There are many different reasons why this can occur. For example, if you have some condition which prevents your lungs from inflating as much as they can, that's going to be a type of restrictive disorder. You have a restriction on the total capacity of air that your lungs can take in. Some conditions that cause this, uh, tuberculosis, uh, if you wind up with that, um, tuberculosis actually winds up carving out little chambers and you wind up uh, developing these what are called tubercles due to the infection with tuberculosis bacteria in your lungs and that reduces your lung capacity. Fibrosis is a condition where you have normal tissues in the lungs being replaced with scar type tissue that's very fibrous and um, <clears throat> if you think about it, the more the more filler tissue like that you have in your lungs, the lower capacity you're going to have for air. Sarcoidosis is a type of autoimmune disease where the immune system is attacking your own tissues and triggering inflammation and they typically have lots of inflammation 
in the connective filler tissues in the lungs. So not so much the alveoli and not so much the bronchial passageways, but those filler tissues in between. But if you have inflammation, you have a lot of swelling in those tissues, that's going to compress the air spaces in the lungs and it's going to reduce capacity. So you have a restriction as far as how much air you can actually take in to the lungs. Also, uh, if you have some sort of muscular disorder, like muscular dystrophy or ALS is another name for Lou Gehrig's disease where you lose muscular function over time and what do you need for breathing? You need those breathing muscles, diaphragm, intercostals and others and so if those muscles are not working properly they're not able to contract properly think about if your diaphragm can't flatten out as easily as it's supposed to you're not going to be able to expand your thoracic cavity as much as you're supposed to and you need to do that to reduce the air pressure in your thoracic cavity so that air will flow in. So those types of disorders are considered to be restrictive as well because they're actually going to uh, reduce your lung capacities. So what you do is you have a pace, patient blow into a spirometer and you um, you can actually do, we have spirometers in our labs at Calhoun and uh, if you took a live in-person class you would do a spirometry exercise in all likelihood but um, you, know, you blow into a spirometer you make these measurements or gauges attached to them and then you can calculate things like these capacities which will help you uh, will help give you some clues about what's going on in a patient with a respiratory disorder. Alright, uh, lecture number seven for the respiratory system we're going to talk more about the gas exchange process. Remember the um, four major processes of respiration. You got ventilation, which we've been talking about so far, and then you've got external respiration where you're exchanging uh, gases between the air and the blood. Then internal respiration, exchange of gases between the blood and the interstitial tissue fluids that surround your cells. Um, and also you have transport in there as well. Transport is what you learned about when we were covering the cardiovascular system. So we're going to be talking about internal and external respiration um, as the next major topic as we move through chapter 22.